sorry, if, if the fire alarm goes off, uh, make your way down the stairs and up onto the top car park. Right, uh, main agenda. Apologies for absence. Tommy. Thank you, Chair. We have apologies from Councillor Sutton and Councillor Fitzherbert is acting as substitute. Thank you. Approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Does that find a mover? Councillor Murphy. Councillor Ball second. <clears throat> Sorry. Yes. We'll go to the vote. All those in favour? Any against? Against? Abstentions. That's carried then. Uh, item three, public participation. Uh, this enables members of the public to ask questions and express views or present petitions. Uh, first up, I've got one here. Uh, we have um, <clears throat> Mr Peter Dobbs, local resident, to comment on the Ashbourne Air Quality Action Plan. <laughs> As usual, Mr Dobbs, you have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillors, my first question was this. Could this council indicate when the consultation on the Ashbourne Air Quality Action Plan, agreed at the uh, last c &E meeting six weeks ago, is due to start? It would seem to be vital that the results of that consultation are available for the next c &E meeting that is due on the 5th of July. And I note, thanks Tommy, the reply and the reasoning, although I'm surprised that a motion approved almost unanimously and cross-party was described as politically sensitive. Moving on, as this council had already recognised in their 2020-2024 corporate plan, mitigation measures that can improve air quality are important. Addressing poor air quality is an ongoing legal requirement and the compilation of an action plan to address the issue is simply the way that the council demonstrates to DEFRA that, is doing, that it is doing something that is effective. It is not in any way something that is supposed to mark the start of the process. And with this in mind, I note that of the 16 actions, which are grouped into nine areas, listed in the draft action plan, agreed for consultation at the last meeting, the overwhelming majority appear to be classified as either ongoing or in place by March 2023, i.e. now. Will it therefore be possible to present the new Community and Environment Committee when it meets in July with a report that gives an appraisal of the effectiveness of those actions currently in place so that their future decisions can be based on data rather than optimism. And this question is the one that doesn't appear to be answered yet. Uh, it's worth remembering that by the time this committee meets again, it will be well over two years from the declaration of an AQMA in Ashbourne and five years after the data indicated that there was a serious air quality problem. And as far as I'm aware, no one in this room is claiming that the problem has been solved. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Dobbs. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Ms Claire Gamble, a local, res local resident, to comment on the uh, report on the Gypsy and Traveller site. Again, you have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. As again, you've introduced me as a resident. I wanted to make it clear that I am speaking as a resident. And as a resident, I, I would like answers to the questions that arise about the Council's basic competence in attempting to find both temporary and permanent sites for travellers. Recent local articles concerning the agreement with the Heights of Abraham and the proposed traveller site at Husker Farm raise serious concerns about the Council's ability to meet its legal duties to the traveller community in terms of due diligence in process and decision making. From the lack of comment from the Council, residents will deduce that the Council's response to serious allegations about its competence in the way it conducted itself over the Husker Farm site is silence. This surely speaks volumes about how much the, co the Council obviously sees any comment as likely to incriminate itself further. While no comment well, may be an effective position for a criminal in a police interview, for a public body that is supposed to command the respect of the people 
that is, that is supposed to serve is at best infantile and at worst raises worrying questions about the Council's integrity. A question immediately arises from the articles is how many of the facts in the local article on Hasker Farm were known to elected leaders when they signed a statement of full confidence in the Chief Executive last week. Given the Hasker Farm petition, states councillors were given a briefing document with key facts and questions prior to the closed meeting in February. Were they really ignorant of the multiple failures of due diligence, good governance and the safeguarding of both children and any vulnerable adults? Is this why now we have this solid silence? How is anyone in the Derbyshire Dale supposed to be reassured by an arrogant refusal to even explain to residents how the council got itself into the position of nearly buying land from a convicted drug dealer with R, the local taxpayer's money. Anyone watching last Thursday's council meeting saw that if a council asks questions or doesn't agree with statements made by the council, they are threatened with the Nolan principles. Will the serious questions about due diligence and good governance raised by the local MP be answered? Is the council concerned that the local MP has gone so far to put out a public statement that seems to indicate a breakdown of trust? If the council were serious about the multiple failures to meet its legal obligation to the travelling community, they would not engage in cover-up and ridiculous games of semantics and silence. They would give the people of Derbyshire Dales the apology they deserve for wasting our money and get on with the job of meeting their responsibilities. They would undertake a root and branch review of their governance and decision-making procedures who knows, this might even help it understand why it has failed the traveller community. And the, uh, after all, and the sole overriding question is that the leadership should ask itself, are they really up to this job? Thank you. The next speaker is Mr John Ewart, planning agent for the owners of the Woodyard, to speak on the Gypsy and Traveller update. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. I hope that all or many of those present today have read my recent email to Councillor Hobson earlier this afternoon on behalf of the owners of the wood yard at Holmesford and on behalf of travellers. My clients and I are indebted to Councillor Hobson for her open engagement with us to James McLaughlin for his comprehensive email recently, which confirms that the Council's request to lease the woodyard is for real, and to Eddie Bisknell for his investigative reporting, based, I believe, on an email trail in itself instigated by councillors. The next step is to complete the process of relocating currently three travellers' families from Matlock Bath Car Park to the agreed, the agreed pitches at the Woodyard. The Councillors' Travellers' Working Group has decided that it is not possible to do this before the May elections. I disagree. There is nothing radically new to prevent the seeding now and occupying before Easter. I urge councillors to take that route. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ewart. Right, moving on, item four, interests. Members are required to declare the existence and nature of any interest they may have in subsequent agenda items in accordance with the District Council's Code of Conduct. These interests are matters that relate to money or that which can be valued in money affecting a member his, her partner, extended family and close friends, interests that become apparent at a later stage in the proceedings may be declared at the time. Do we have any interests? Okay, thank you. Uh, item five, questions pursuant to rule of procedure number 15. Okay, thanks James, there are none. Right, we move to the uh, main agenda. Item six, supported housing improvement programme. Thanks, Chair. Um, the report is asking members to note Derbyshire District Council's successful partnership bid for the Supported Housing Improvement Programme and approve the expenditure of the grant. 
I think it's helpful to do a little bit of background uh, in relation to supported accommodation. Supported accommodation covers a wide range of client groups, um, particularly around domestic abuse and learning disability, but predominantly supported accommodation has grown in one particular area, providing supported accommodation for single homelessness, provide, providing accommodation for those generally unable to access social housing and private rents, largely due to um, history of drug, alcohol, mental health, criminal behaviour or poor tenancy history. Supported accommodation is provided in a different owner and financial models. Some detail I've set out in the report, but as you can see, it's quite a complicated scenario in many cases. Um, and this is very technical. Um, some accommodation impacts directly on the council's finances. There's very little regulation to stop providers set up, charge higher levels of rent and provide minimal support provisions. As part of a two year review across the county, we found a number of issues um, including support that doesn't meet the needs of the individuals, poor housing conditions, high crime rates in, in and around supported accommodation, negative impact on neighbours and local businesses, poor outcomes, high rates of tenancy failures, and for some constant cycle of homelessness passed from provider to provider. This is mirrored across the country and the reason that a pilot was introduced to look at ways to improve, which has led to this second round of the grant funding, which we've been successful in gaining only one of 29 successful bids across the country. Here in the Dales, we have 12 schemes, seven are not registered providers, which includes a, a total of 103 units of supported accommodation. When you take that into comparison of, of 2,500 across Derbyshire and Staffordshire Moorlands. This report sets out how the ship will operate in the Dales. The funding will allow us to have a dedicated resource to visit schemes and tenants. This will be mirrored across the other partner councils sharing processes and procedures. The ship officer will lead a coordinated approach across all sections of the council and interact already with those already providing services to those supported accommodation providers, meeting regularly to understand the issues and form plans and improvements with those providers. The government will evaluate our progress along with all the other pilot councils, which will be shared as best practice and influence future regulation and policy. And obviously we'll bring reports back to um, members to, to show our progress. The aim of this project is to deliver as standard good quality supported housing, which is vital to providing a safe, stable and supportive place to live, giving real prospects to allow people to move on to independent living. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Councillor Hughes. Thank you, Chair. I've got one question about the report and then I have a slightly different question. I might ask your forbearance on that particular question. Uh, on, the, on the report, I noticed that there was a deficit um, that we will, uh, in the funding available from central government that we have to we have to find. Is that all? Is that already within the budget for uh, the next financial year, or is that is that something ad additional to the budget? No, that's already in the budget for okay. next financial year. All right, thank you very much. Uh, now, for, for one, I may ask for forbearance. Um, uh, Councillor Wayne and I have been to see residents of. Uh, Deanfields Court and uh, Victoria Court, which I don't think fall into this category, but we're aware of the, and I think um, Mr. Coggins and, and his team are also aware of the um, 37 or 38 percent increase in uh, rent and um, and uh, charges on those on, in those homes, and uh, we we believe that's also happening in Ashbourne and in Gateway Court in Matlock and possibly in Bakewell. Um, uh, Mr. Coggins, would you be able, through the chair, to provide a very brief up, uh, knowing that this is off, off, off topic, really, but would you be able to provide a very brief update on where, where we are in 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 considering this with Age UK? Thank you, chair. Yes, um, uh, Simon may chip in as well because uh, he's close to this subject, um, but essentially. Um, housing providers who provide uh, sheltered accommodation, um, whether it's a communal heating source, uh, uh, like everybody else, facing the same increases in um, in their fuel bills, and um, those charges are being passed on to, to tenants. Now we know from our work with um, uh, Platform and uh, uh, Age UK, who provide a lot of advice and support to residents in the Dales um, from from this building, in fact, that. Um, many people are being left with uh, not a lot of money left over after the increased charges. So this this is a very live um, issue. It's only just come to light with um, with Platform. Uh, and we've been talking to them to try and get a sense of, um, what, you know, understanding how they got to this point, really. But essentially, I think it is much that, that they're passing on increased charges um, to their tenants. 
as my understanding is that they haven't done any consultation on that um, and um, uh, but they won't be the only provider in the country doing doing this in the same way so there's a bit of work to do to, un to get to the bottom of it and try and find out how through either our own support to tenants because uh, we access services and uh, funding to do with um, helping people sustain the tenancy um, but there's a lot of people in those sheltered schemes who I doubt we can realistically fund everybody with their, with their bills. But working with AGK, with Platform, we hope to come um, to a more support and, and a proper answer for, for the residents. Um, right, thank you, thank you very much. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Councillor O'Brien, did you have a question? I did. I have a, a brief uh, financial question. Um, I see that the the council is the um, accountable body for this uh, program on behalf of uh, all the other authorities in Staffordshire Moorlands, um, um, but is not intending to take any management fee out of the award, um, even though all the local authorities are receiving the same uh, allocation. Given the, the financial stress that our uh, finance services under uh, at the current time, why are we not uh, proposing to take um, uh, some sort of fee out of the um, out of the allocation to help relieve that stress and provide additional resources for the finance service to manage this program on behalf of all the authorities? Yeah, so that's that. Um, so we led on the bid. That was our role, um, and we are. The, the bankers and, and our role has just purely been to pass that money directly onto those other local authorities so that it's just been one transaction out and that money's gone out of the door. Um, there was a little bit of money in there for us to pick up some of the evaluation as that. So in the first year, we'll take £3,500 towards that evaluation. Year two, uh, 3800 and year three, 3800 as well. But in, in, we've got a, a shared um, memo of understanding in terms of um, that, that financial risk is shared across all nine districts and boroughs. Like I say, all we've done is received as, as a single point of, of payment into this authority, and that money has been directly dispersed to each in, each of those individual local authorities. Councillor Ratcliffe. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I mean, uh, how could we not support such a programme as this uh, that has such a high um, social intentions, if I can express it that way. But I, I, I'd like to ask you questions really, Simon, about paragraph 2.4 uh, and the the news, which I didn't know, about Derbyshire Dales having the lowest number of supported accommodation units, uh, and certainly low and disproportionate, given the head of our population. So two points in relation to that, if I may. First of all, the numbers, were they a result, even in an indirect way, of closures that took place some 10 years ago, I think, brought about by, I think, efficiency savings of one sort or another by the County Council. I particularly remember an extremely valuable uh, and efficient women's refuge that we had in Worksworth that was uh, uh, subject to closure, uh, much to the chagrin of uh, uh, local uh, groups and organisations. And then secondly, um, what can we do about it? Uh, I mean, will this funding, this grant and the programme go anyway towards increasing our uh, uh, the numbers of our accommodation uh, and if it doesn't it, are there other sources that we can look to because I, I I wouldn't want to sort of just sit back and accept this it seems to me something really that we should be making some interventions towards uh, increasing these numbers so two two things really for you Thank you, Jack. Yeah, um, so, yeah, we've definitely seen a reduction in the numbers of support accommodation following the sort of supporting people programme ending. Um, and we've seen um, providers sort of 
mainstream providers leave the area um, and that some of that's been picked up by local providers um, so we, we have seen a reduction in, in that in that sense um, what can we do about improving or increasing those numbers again we we've got to be a little bit careful in that because obviously as, as the report sets out there's two types of provider one of which has no financial impact on the local authority and one that does have a financial impact on the local authority so we want to try and encourage registered providers into the area to um, to bring accommodation and schemes forward but we we have no say really so if, if a private provider wants to set up tomorrow and provide a unit of 20 units for accommodation there's very little we can do to say no and we would have to work with that and, and try and challenge that in other ways hence why this project is brought forward yeah. to, to bring those other players into place to make sure that you know planning are, are in consideration of that to make sure housing benefits are doing their bit to make uh, in consideration of, of those um, those placements so we we as part of this project what we are what we will be doing and across the counties is doing a needs assessment um, to understand what type of accommodation we need where because the other issue we've got in relation to the accommodation we have that's generally provider um, led and um, and private provider led is the money that they take in on the rents only covers a very um, minimal amount of support and it's it's the accommodation that we need that requires that additional level of support um, with those more uh, that, that need that, that those extra hours but it's where that money comes from um, and that that can't come out of the rent and somebody's got to provide that that level of payment to get that additional support so that's something else we've got to work on uh, and, and again, that's where registered providers come in that we wouldn't lose that element of rent. So we are having those negotiations and, and talks, um, but it's, it's looking at the right, the right prospect, you know, the right property in the right area for the right, the right use. Would, uh, if you'll allow me just very quickly, would I be right, Simon, that planning approval was given for a similar type of accommodation in Dolly Dale a few months ago? I believe it was, yeah. 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 yeah that, and that's the sort of thing that we're looking yeah. towards, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Councillor Wade. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd just like, there are some questions, but just what Mr. Coggan said earlier on and alluding to what Councillor Rackley said, there are only 99. I do feel that if there isn't some meaningful and proactive uh, work done, for the people in the two locations councillor hughes mentioned uh the, the home uh, you know the uh, victoria court <laughs> that might go up so we need to be very careful that some, we we do do something on that um on 7.2 uh, it's asking for the committee's approval uh, the director of resources um will use their delegated authority under the financial regulation will that be the funds there will be what is coming out of the actual grant, I presume. It, there won't be anything other that the council has got to find. That's the first question. Uh, the second question is, um, obviously, I've been in touch with yourselves um, in relation to issues at the private uh, residences in Matlock. And always the response is, uh, it's not our re responsibility. It is, you know, it's their responsibility who they put in there, etc. With this, are we going to have some more teeth that we can have? We can be more, um, you know, we, we can be more positive in what we want, who we want in the area. And we're not necessarily going to get people housed all the time from Sheffield that have got some, we may be just really released from prison. Thank you. Yeah, certainly to, to answer your first question on, on the funding, yes, there, there is no additional funding that we'll be paying out as part of this project. This is the money and that's what we'll be spending. We won't be spending any more. If anything, hopefully this project will bring us savings in that subsidy loss and other areas um, when we put you know, the, the, the thumb screws on, on some of the, the, other, the other schemes. But, but you're right, it's, it's what this will do is we'll bring a proactive approach to look at those existing schemes Again, I don't want to name names or, or make places, but we've we've done a desk exercise to to acknowledge those that we we um, we accept as red, amber, and green. So the red ones will be the first ones we target, and as I say, that'll be a joint a joint target. So as as things stand at the moment, as as local authority, we we work in 
um, obviously in, in different ways. So um, environmental health will, will go out and do inspections of, of property for one particular reason. Housing benefits will pay the housing benefit and us as housing will make referrals into those schemes. And this project is bringing us all together so we all understand the roles that we play um, so we can identify those issues um, and make sort of real term changes to those those sorts of schemes. Um, so yes, so things so we, we can influence environmental health in relation to licensing um, and they can put restrictions within the license or, or you know choose not to give renew that license when that comes up and again part of this project is having one single person within the organization collecting all of that information so we can make informed decisions as we go along to improve that, that those schemes that need that improvement thanks sir. can i just come back fleetingly um and is it your plan to consult with ward members for the ship officer to be consulting with ward members because they are should be the eyes and ears in the community um so uh, you know none of us know whether we'll be here <laughs> come the fourth or fifth of may but at the end of the day um i think it's important that there is some consultation with ward members thank you yeah no, happy to do that certainly I'll, I'll, happy to, in, to to bring ward members in as part of some of those meetings yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you any more questions, members? Councillor Burfoot. Yeah, I wasn't going to ask a question, but once it just occurred to me, a couple of weeks ago, at the time of the snow, uh, a gentleman who was from Nottingham, actually, but was homeless, and he'd been living in Corder Quarry for several weeks in an old building, uh, went to one of the churches, local churches, warm spaces schemes, and to seek refuge, I think, during the very cold weather. And we had a phone call from the ladies who were looking after him there. So he had nowhere to go that night. I think, um, to cut the long story short, by the time um, that they were about to close, uh, I think we did get some response from the housing department. And um, the accommodation was found for him for, I think, three or four days at the Premier Inn. But I, I wanted to know what, what would normally happen after that. I mean, if he's not, he's, he's no address within, in fact, no address at all, apparently, even in Nottingham, never mind in, in Derbyshire Dales. What's the position that the council takes up with the, so somebody in that position who is desperate for some sort of shelter, uh, especially during the winter? Um, I, I could I could give an all night answer in relation to homelessness legislation, um, but generally, again, this this is what this you know this this accommodation is is for in part. We we have to again we have to be a little bit careful about where people come from and what duty we have and whether that duty is owed somewhere else um, and again you know we need to do lots of backgrounds in terms of what that person presents to us those concerns and, and this is the issue that we have with some of the supported accommodation and some of the, the breakdowns because they are taking clients that have got way too more way many more needs than they can actually support with the expertise as they have that then overspills and causes issues in the local area. So we've got to be very careful about those those needs assessments. And that's one thing that we're going to be upskilling our providers in doing. But in, in the case that you, you, you're talking about, um, what we did is we, we joined forces with other local authorities in Derbyshire and we provided a, a winter shelter, as we did at Mount Cook um, in our own area. This, this year it was Amber Valley's turn. Um, and, and I understand that gentleman um, was was accommodated within that scheme as soon as we could get a place available within that, that project. Okay. okay, members, we'll move to debate. Oh, does this find a mover? Thank you, Councillor Hughes. Second, Councillor Wayne. Anyone else? Yeah, do you want to speak? I just want to say a few words. <laughs> Can I, <say? laughs> I just want to say thank you to Rob and his team for the excellent work they do in this area. I mean, we've been involved with one or two people who we've, we've um, put in, in contact with them, and uh, it's a very difficult job. And uh, we've, do, I mean, I, I really appreciate that it's done well in, in Derbyshire Dale, so thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ball, did you want to speak? Please. Thank you. I'd like to obviously echo what uh, council users said. Um, I do find that um, in the, in this situation of our council, um, the officers sat before us do work very hard in securing these grants and do put them to very much good use for the members of the public that are in mostly in need. So I do commend everything that we all do. 
So, and I'm really happy to support this project. Councillor Wayne. Yeah, that was a quick one, wasn't it? With David and myself. <laughs> But, I've uh, always got you out of the corner of me, I can. <laughs> I'll bear that in mind, Chair. Thank you. But, uh, no, I, I think uh, we need some good news, don't we? And at the end of the day, this is good news. And it, we're very good at this. We, you know, it's something in relation to homelessness. Uh, we have to be very pleased that we've got loan, ha, ha, houses, homeless numbers in our area. Um but we can't become complacent, and that's not something that either Rob or Simon will ever do. So I think uh, I'm more than happy to second it, and uh, I'm proud to be part of uh, the organisation that gets the grant, and thank you very much. Cheers. So that's been moved and seconded. All those in favour? Thank you. Right, item seven, fees and charges, local land charges and legal services. James. Do you want this? Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, members. This report is submitted to you this evening to respond to a decision recently taken by Derbyshire County Council to increase its fees for COM29 local searches in respect of highways queries. Um, as the report sets out, these have risen from £30.80 to £76, uh, inclusive of VAT for specific highways searches, and from £6.80 to £26 per question in respect of COM29 questions generally. Um, these changes were communicated to the District Council and to all districts and boroughs in Derbyshire after we had our Governance and Resources Committee meeting uh, in February, on the 16th of February where members of that committee had approved the, uh, the the district council's list of fees and charges. So this report responds uh, to the uh, decision of Derbyshire County Council. Um, the report also sets out the representations that were raised and the response that's been received. Um, and it indicates that the officers of the uh, county council were not prepared to reconsider the increase in the, the fees to be levied by the county council. Um, this paper sets out the options for members to consider in response to this, um, but the approach of increasing the fee levy by this council is recommended to you this evening. This will ensure that this council's agreed budget position is not affected by a reduced level of income, and it's anticipated that we will maintain our share of market activity in respect of this, this function. Uh, the effect of the recommendation would also see an increase that reflects that which was agreed by Derbyshire County Council, um, and the reasons for that recommendation are set out before you this evening. Um, the report also sets out uh, that agreement is required to confee, confirm a fee levied by legal services in respect of sales of council land, sales of land by tender and sales of land by auction. This was included in the report to GNR committee, but the actual figure was not included. So to ensure that the decision is made correctly, there's a recommendation before you tonight to include the figure of £507.47 uh, uh, which represents an increase of 5% on the current financial year. Um, Chair, I suspect members will have questions on this, so I'll pause now uh, and we'll be happy to take any questions. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I, I think you've actually just answered my question because I was going to ask you uh, what our percentage increase is in relation to that of the County Council. Uh, and then I want to continue by making a comment <laughs> Uh, I, I suppose, w w with a, a rhetorical question attached, I don't suppose that we can actually refuse uh, this as such. Um, you know, there's no sort of get-out clause that might involve us sending something back to the county council to say that members here would be are absolutely would be should be gobsmacked at the percentage increases that uh, have been applied to these uh, charges that are leaving us almost no option but to go ahead and, and increase them ourselves. Uh, but I, I, I think what I've heard is it, it, it certainly doesn't approach these extortionate um, uh, figures that are, are mentioned in 2.2. Um, I'm absolutely amazed. I mean, no, no wonder... Um, cost of living and 
what's the name is uh, <laughs> is rising so rapidly if everything is subject to this sort of uh, uh, hike. Thank you, Councillor Ratcliffe, through you, Chair. Um, the, the fees that the this council um, levy for land charges and those particular searches were increased by just under 5% uh, at the meeting of the GNR committee. Yeah. And you, you'll be aware that all of the fees and charges levied by the council have not increased by um, more, well, certainly not in, 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 in the same percentage terms that, of the, the increase there. The reason given by the County Council set out in the in within the report as to why they've increased it and for those who've not read it, um, the, the, the reason given is that they've not had a, an increase in these fees for some were estimated to be in the region of 30 years is the reason that we've given. So that's their reasoning for, for that, that decision. Um, however, that's a matter for the County Council. The matter you've got before you this evening is to determine whether you are um, willing to increase the fees to ensure that this council doesn't um, you know, encounter a significant hit in its um, income in this area. Um, but it's regrettable that the decision wasn't communicated in good time uh, before, before GNR committee was um, asked to make a decision. Any more questions, members? Okay, we'll move into debate. Does this find a mover? Councillor Fitzherbert uh, and Councillor Hobson. It's, it seems regrettable. I don't know when they were last uh, increased before, but I think we've got no other option, but so I'll move the recommendations, please. Thank you. Councillor Hobson. I'll echo those comments and I'll second. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wayne. Let me just make an observation. It, it's, uh, to me, it's no real excuse that the council has been dilatory and the district council, the county council has been dilatory and not, not checking their fees for possibly 30 years. Um, <laughs> I sincerely hope that they improve their quality of service because it, it's a massive increase for people that are going to have to pay in these things. I can understand that uh, it's something that we've got to actually go with now. But is it possible that we could, I mean, have we made our feelings known? Thank you. I, I know that's a question, but I'm sorry. Chair, I know we're in debate, but just to, just to break the rules um, on, on this particular occasion as an officer speaking in, in, at this point, um, we have made representations um, to the County Council, not just to the, the lower level officers, but I know that the Chief Executive has put it on the agenda for the county wide chief is ex meeting, so it has been raised at this, the highest level by officers. Anyone else want to speak in debate? No. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. All those in favour? Unanimous again, thank you. Uh, item 8 Gypsy and Traveller um, <coughs> Site Provision Working Group. Councillor Hobson. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to thank everybody who's come to participate this evening. Um, I would ask that the points and questions raised by those people are addressed and they are written to and all members of the Council are included in those replies and that copies are placed on our website, please. Uh, also, Mr Yowett um, has raised some specific email questions. I would ask that they are also addressed promptly. Thank you. I'm happy to propose the recommendations in this report. This is not my report or those of the officers, although I do thank them for all their assistance with this, particularly James, who has uh, been with us at all our meetings, I believe. It's the final report from the cross-party Gypsy and Traveller Working Group for this council term. Derbyshire Dales District Council have a duty of care to certain homeless travellers, traveller families in our area and we must try to fulfil our obligations. I'm going to quote Councillor Flitter again, who said at the outset when we set up the Gypsy and Traveller Working Group that this could not be a desktop exercise and many hours have been spent by this group at both virtual and in-person meetings to reach this stage. I want to pay tribute to my colleagues from all parties who've given their time and effort to this group. 
I am confident that all our work has been conducted in a proper manner, demonstrating good governance at all times. I will reiterate again that it is for elected members to decide as to how we proceed, but I would hope that on reading the report, you will accept the recommendations that are put forward. Thank you. Councillor Morley. Uh, thank you, Chair. I will clearly support that because I'm a member of the group. And there's one little item that uh, Councillor Hobson missed. Not only have we had virtual and face-to-face -face meetings, we've been on a tour and we've looked at the sites. We've actually been had boots on the ground checking them out. So it has been a very thorough exercise. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Murphy. <coughs> thank you, Chair. Um, I met uh, some individuals from uh, Matlock Bath last night and uh, they're uh, obviously quite desperate residents as well as the, uh, the business owners in the town. They, they believe that uh, they've done more than their fair share and they, you know, they were told that the 31st of January would be the time when the travellers would be moved on. Now, listening uh, to Mr Yowett, this sounds like... Uh, there's an opportunity to look at this uh, Woodyard's development, uh, this site. Could you, could somebody give me some idea how quickly we could possibly take advantage of this opportunity? Um, because the traders in Matlock Bath rely on this, this seasonal trade and the coaches to come to the town. And they're fearing that these coaches are not going to come uh, and, and, and uh, to Matlock Bath. Therefore, they are looking at a quite a desperate situation. Now, can we give them some hope? Can we talk about some timescales? Sounds like the woodyard would be ideal. We've got some desperate folk out there who want to know that they're going to survive this trading period for the next six months. Through you, Chair, it probably falls to me to explain the decision-making process that, that needs to be followed. And um, Mr Ewart explained earlier on that I'd emailed him to communicate what that decision-making process would be. Members will be aware that the notice of election was published for this council today for the elections that will take place on the 4th of May. So this is the final meeting of a policy committee or the council, other than planning committee. So there isn't an opportunity for members to meet this side of the local elections to determine any of the recommendations before you tonight um, from the Traveller Working Group. So in terms of the actual decision-making process that, that would need to be undertaken, at the moment only Council has the authority to make decisions on that. There won't be another meeting of the Council until the annual meeting, which I think is the 25th of May, uh, which is three weeks after the election. Um, this isn't a matter that officers can determine. Um, there are no delegated powers to do that. And it's not... Um, it's not something I would recommend officers to make decisions on given what's happened previously. Um, so in terms of the decision-making process, no decision by this council can be made until May at the earliest. Uh, and, and that will depend on the political composition of the council after the elections as well. So I, not for me to comment on the points you've made about what businesses have said in Matlock Bath, but we as officers have engaged with the parish council and we've heard the representations that they've been making. So I think the council is aware and, and Tim might be able to comment on the, the work that his team have done to, to, to manage the situation down there. I can comment a little bit on that. I can also comment on the, the views of the family uh, in that lot bath, which perhaps Councillor Hobson could confirm from the meeting we held with them. Um, the, the family are quite clear that they don't consider that site to be suitable for them and, and they've said that they won't occupy it. That, that I can really report to members as their point of view and hopefully Councillor Hobson can confirm that. In terms of the site of Matlock Bath, it's um, clearly in a busy car park. It's in an area where it does impact on the ability of coaches to uh, to, to, to park. Um, officers can try and make mitigation measures in respect of that, and, and some of those are set out in the report. Um, our colleagues who work, our colleague Vicky Hatfield, who works in car parks, has worked hard on providing that information, uh, and we'll continue to do all we can to support that trade. Um, I have no more to say on that, but just think that that information is relevant for members to be aware of. Just on, Councillor O'Brien. 
Thank you, Chair. Are you taking questions, Chair? Yes. Um, I've got three questions. Um, I, I note that the report helpfully sets out the criteria that the uh, working group have been using to uh, evaluate the sites under consideration. Uh, so with that in mind, can you assure me that uh, no site is currently under consideration for use as a traveller site? This has been the subject of a refusal of planning permission by this council within the last 12 months on the grounds that it does not comply with local plan policy HC6. My second question, I understand that the traveller family to whom the council has a homelessness duty have certain specific vulnerabilities. In these circumstances, circumstances, can you confirm that the family will not be compelled to locate to a site which they do not consider meets their needs or requirements in respect of, their, of these vulnerabilities? And my third question, in July 2021, uh, in the light of a um, proposal from Council of Herbert, uh, the Council resolved unanimously that the identification of temporary and permanent sites for travellers is undertaken as part of the local plan review. As such, it would be transparent, open to public uh, scrutiny and fully democratic. Can you tell me why this decision of the Council appears to have been ignored? I can I can answer the third question uh, first, Chair, in respect of the decision of the Council in July 2021. There was a subsequent decision taken by Council on the 29th of September 2022 to establish a separate working party, the, of which you've got the report in front of you this evening, to specifically address the, the temporary issue. Uh, there was absolute clarity that it was not to address the, perm the question of a permanent traveller site through that working group. Um, but obviously, council can decide to take different decisions at different points. So that was the reason why that particular activity was taken forward in terms of temporary site by the working group. Um, in terms of the policy position in relation to the site that Mr. Hewitt referred to earlier on, no decisions have been taken in respect of that matter. There have been discussions ongoing at the request of the Traveller, uh, Gypsy and Traveller Site Provision Working Group to establish whether the use of that land may be a possibility, but it hasn't committed the Council to any decision because, of course, only Council can make any decision in respect of that matter. Um, the discussions that have been taking place have been on a commercially sensitive basis to establish what potential values might be attached to the land if an agreement could be reached on it, and any information on that would be brought back to Council for a decision at a future point. Um, Tim might be able to comment on the, the planning side of things as that's his area of expertise but that, that's the answer I can provide at this point Chair. Thank you, thank you uh, Chair, thank you James. Um, one of the, purely factually, one of the sites that, that is, is re referred to in the report has had planning permission reviews for a permanent site on it within the last 12 months, has previously had permission for a temporary site on it um, some years ago. Uh, in relation to um, the vulnerabilities of a family, Councillor Ryan's quite correct. One of the families does has, have significant vulnerabilities, um, and they're the family I referred to earlier who considered that that site is not suitable for their particular needs. We are dealing with two homeless families, um, both of which require accommodation um, in some way or another, uh, and that might be worth members bearing in mind as well as we go forward. Councillor Hughes. Thank you, Chair. My question has been answered. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Murphy. Uh, how long have we been discussing with the agent uh, for Woodyards uh, the proposal possibly to uh, put the travellers on that site? I mean, this recent sort of a, a approach, because I believe we approached the, uh, the agent uh, some time ago. Thank you, Chair. I can answer that question. So uh, at the request of the working group, an initial approach was made before Christmas um, and negotiations have been ongoing since that point. You'll appreciate because this is a member-led process. Every time we've had a response from the agent acting on behalf of the council, that's had to go back to the working group. A steer has then been taken by the working group. Instructions have then been given to the agent and inevitably these things take time because 
it's a member-led process and it's not it's not moving at speed. Councillor Berthel. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I note that um, Mr. McLaughlin says that um, officers uh, won't be able to undertake any further work on the in terms of the recommendations for working group until after the elections. But is there any sort of uh, preliminary work which can be carried out uh, by officers in terms of uh, the, the a full appraisal of the privately owned site, for instance, uh, and uh, to make some um, agreement possibly with total parking solutions in, in respect of the coach parking or potential po co coach parking at Cromford Meadows, an alternative location for coaches, so that uh, Matlock Bath Station car park isn't impacted by uh, comings and goings of uh, both coaches and their, and their passengers, um, who may be affected by the uh, by the presence of the travellers. But but also, um, another question occurs to me, we've we'll been talking for months now, if not years, about two homeless families. What if, uh, I mean, every time extra travellers turn up at the, our car parks, possibly because they know that the two families, or one of the two families uh, that we're trying to protect and find accommodation for, um, that they have to, I understand, prove homelessness in order to... Uh, uh, or if that's if, prove, if, if they can't prove homelessness, rather, uh, the council can then proceed to evict them with a court order. So if if homelessness is proved, then we're obviously in an even more tricky situation in term, or challenging situation in terms of having to provide uh, even more spaces on uh, or new sites for travellers, or permanent sites, if not total, uh, per, or temporary t tolerated sites, um, in order to accommodate extra families. We've no idea how often these families are going to turn up either in our district or in other districts in, in Derbyshire or wherever. I mean, it so happens that I think I'm right in saying that the that High Peak Borough Council don't have had any um, gypsy and traveller sites. It's just by chance that we have two in Derbyshire Dales, but it could it could increase at any moment in time. So, but we haven't really got any, any provision um, for, for those families um, in the foreseeable future. So I just wonder what we would do if we had extra families um, to, that we're forced to accommodate by law. Chair, if I deal with the first part, perhaps Tim or Rob could come in and deal with the second part of Councillor Burford's question. So the first part of the question was in terms of the decision-making process and whether anything could be, could be undertaken. Certainly in terms of the, um, car, uh, the coach parking provision, uh, I don't believe that requires a member decision to take that forward. Um, and you know, uh, I, I'd be happy to, to to tell officers that they can they can, enter, you know, continue negotiations and reach an agreement if that that needs to be taken taken forward. Um, in relation to the the the, the first recommendation that um, is in the conclusions of section of the report around undertaking a full appraisal of the the privately owned site to assess viability, um, there's a steer from the working group to do that. Um, and I, I do think that that could be taken forward, um, potentially, because it's not officers doing that. That would have to be done again externally um, by the, the by the agents that, that we've um, we've instructed. So that potentially could be taken forward with a view to a report coming forward back to the to the whatever the the working group looks like after the election, or whether it comes to council. But ultimately, members will have to make that that decision um, on that to decide whether they wish to proceed or or otherwise. Um, Tim, I don't know whether you're going to pick up the second part of Council Burford's question. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'll kick off and, and Rob will time. I may wish to join in. Um, where, where additional travellers join either of the encampments, then, then they're visited as soon as we're aware of them and an, ass an assessment is made of their welfare needs in the way the law requires uh, and, and in the way it's common with, with what you might call unauthorised encampments. Um, if uh, those those people express some desire to be considered as homeless then then a consultation will be undertaken with rob's team which in effect means silent <coughs> in this particular issue uh, and um we have that conversation and, and that that claim is assessed um, not only do they have to show homelessness but they have to show a local connection um so there has to be a degree of of that they have to be able to show they've been traveling in the Derbyshire Dells for a considerable period of time we, we've not yet had anybody join the site who um who, who hasn't been, you know, who, who, who randomly turns up, who we've had to accommodate. We, and we are, you, we are successful in being able to evict them where that's the right thing to do. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe, did you have a question? 
No, Chair. No, no. Okay, Councillor Buttle. No. Oh, thanks, thanks. Um, would we have no statutory duty whatsoever to provide pictures for gypsies and travellers if we had no homelessly homeless travellers or gypsies registered with us as Perhaps if I kick off on this one as well, and I may have to call on the expertise of my colleagues on this one. Um, the, the level of provision that we're required to have is set out in the local plan, and that's informed by something called a Gypsy and Traveller Accommodation Assessment, which is a study that's done roughly every five years or so, um, which tries to evaluate the level of need for that particular community. Bearing in mind that Gypsy and Traveller community is not just visible caravans on car parks. There are people in settled accommodation there are people on that we, we have a, as Councillor Morley will attest, we have a site down in the south of the district which is now established uh, and is, is welcomed in that area. Um, so, so there's a variety of, of different um, people that are included in that particular study. And that will set out, that will recommend the numbers that go forward to the local plan. We'll also take account of growth in those families. So, for example, in the site in the south of the, of the, of the district, if there are uh, young people who are likely to want to leave home then, and their needs need to be accommodated somewhere, then they'll be assessed in the Gypsy and Traveller Accommodation Assessment and go forward into the local plan. Uh, but yes, in general, if there were no homeless families for, for us to find accommodation for, um, then there would the, the, the needs expressed in the local plan would be that much less. Um, there would be fewer people for whom we would owe a duty. So it does all stem from, from the fact that people need somewhere to live um, in, in the way of a permanent site on which to site their caravans. Uh, so, just to be clear, we, we actually have to find, because of the people we've got registered as homeless, as gypsy and travellers, we have to find three, five, seven, eight, how many pictures? The current local plan, that rises to nine over the lifetime of that plan. I can't quote the exact figures per, per period within it, but it rises, it was six rising to nine over the period. There is um, an ongoing, there is work ongoing to, to refresh the, uh, the Gypsy and Traveller Accommodation Assessment. The new figures that arise from that will be incorporated into the local plan. Mike, Mike Hayes and myself are linked into that work uh, through a countywide group. Councillor Hobson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm mindful of what uh, James has already said. Um, at, the, at the closed Traveller Workshop meeting that we had, I did request that a report come from the Gypsy and Traveller Working Group and be provided to Council before the end of this term. And as you know, we've just only recently had a meeting, so the report has been updated. We are very mindful that um, Council members make these decisions and it's not the place of the Working Group to do that. It has to come through. But I'm minded by what James has said and also the comments of other members here that would it be possible, James, to amend or change a recommendation um, having regard to all the relevant information to move things forwards without taking any decisions? Um, or could we continue with our your negotiations? Could we look at that car park site? Is that something that we are legally able to do? Thank you. So certainly in terms of the, the, the coach park, issue um, as I said on the meeting on Tuesday I think that can be dealt with by officers independently that's not a decision in relation to the sighting of gypsies and travellers um, in terms of the the appraisal work that the working group have asked for um, I do think that probably can be taken forward um, with a view to a report coming to council making a recommendation from the working group one way or another on receipt of that that appraisal however I'm conscious of the the period of time that we've just entered um, we didn't have a, a definite uh, we don't have a decision making body to give us that authority to do that at the moment so um, unless this committee were minded to, to make a recommendation to council um, I'm still struggling to see how we would actually be able to give effect to that decision. I'm mindful that we must uh, stick within the, the rules of decision making uh, you've said about the car park and Councillor Burford, you know, and I'm conscious of what Councillor Murphy said uh, for the, you know, the visitors coming to Mount Lock Bath, that, you know, Vicky Hatfield came with several suggestions and th this was the one that we thought as a working group should come forward. Um, 
and without going through the financial too much of the financial implications they weren't they weren't too onerous and we weren't locked into something for a long time we were trying to have a pragmatic approach uh, as the holiday tourist season approaches um i think we need to gauge what the the members of this group think about whether there's going to be a hiatus on on things or whether they are mindful to say we will continue recommend to the council that um, you know we we will be continuing with things i'm guided by you james um i think chair the recommendation that, that the working group has made um is directed at council uh, and, and it does state that the the recommendation has been made to council after the election and whilst i think recommendation b can be dealt with separately that, don't, that doesn't require a council decision um recommendation a um I'd like to take a bit more time to think yeah, about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not wanting to put you on the spot. spot. It's just that you can sense people's frustration that, you know, things are stopping. And, you know, this is the legal situation that we're in. So I'm not wanting to do anything um, that we're not supposed to be doing. Chair, through you, if I can just check the terms of reference for the working group, that might be able to make me uh, reach a decision on that. So if you want to take some of the questions in the meantime. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Wayne. Thank you, Chair. Um, not getting too parochial on it, just an observation, but I, I wish as much thought and, with, you know, with, had been put into the travellers that we've had for two years on the railway station at Matlock, because that impacts upon this town um, and has done for two years. So uh, I think we've got a, we've got an opportunity. We've got an opportunity in front of us here. I've, I've read what, what the email from Mr. Yeo at this more this afternoon, um, and the question that there are a number of questions I want to ask really. Um, having had sight of Mr. Ewart's email and the comment made by Mr. Braund, one person is saying that the travellers would like to, you know are comfortable with going to the woodyard, the others are not. That's some work that needs doing, most definitely to establish that. Is that something that could be added? That's the first question. Because we've got to have a definitive. We don't want, like Councillor O'Brien said, we do not want people to be going and be put in potentially dangerous situations. I, I, that doesn't sit well with me, and I hope it doesn't sit well with anybody else in this room. Um, just a thought. Um, we've still got leaders, leaders groups, and we've still got um, political leaders. That is it something that a decision could be made, a delegated decision that could be made by them? Um, up to the 4th of May. That, that's the second question. And the other question is something about planning. Because it's my understanding that we've got two temporary tolerated sites that I'm not sure whether they are temporary tolerated sites, but neither of them have got planning. So is that such a big issue? That's the third question. Thank you. Tim, you might want to take the first one, I'll take the second one. Thank you, James. Um, yeah, that makes sense. We're, we're dealing with two families who want to be located on different sites. They don't want to be located together. One of those families, by virtue of the vulnerabilities in their group, as Councillor O'Brien quite correctly pointed out, do not want to occupy the particular site we've been talking about. The other family ha uh, have not expressed that view. The other family ha have suggested they might, be, um, they might be amenable to the idea of going to that site. When that was discussed in the, the Traveller Working Group last week, um, last week or this week, whenever it was, the last Traveller Working Group, um, it was agreed that, that we would talk to that family and find out their correct feelings in relation to that. Um, the, the family at Matlock Bath is also quite unequivocal in their view and, and voiced that when talking to members of the Traveller Working Group. Chair, I'll, I'll deal with the second question around decision making. I think. Um, there, there is no delegated authority for group leaders to take decisions. Um, delegate individuals who can make decisions are officers. Um, you can't delegate decision making to an individual member or group of members. And even if even if the political will was there, it would still need council to do to do that. But going back to the the point that Councillor Hobson made previously, if I can, in terms of the 
the, the decision making process when I've looked at the the remit that council gave to the Gypsy and Traveller Side Provision Working Group, it was to consider the viability of options um, against the criteria established in policy HC6 of the Dives Local Plan. So if 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 the if the uh, decision was for that appraisal to look at the viability of options against the local plan uh, provision there, then I think that could be taken forward um, with a view to the, the working group bringing something back to council um, if it if it wished to do so. Um, but we are, I, I'm, I'm referring to, if you look in your report at uh, paragraph 1.2a, that's that point about considering the viability of options against the criteria established in policy HC6. Councillor Wayne, you asked a further question about planning, didn't you, and planning permission. Um, Tim, are you the expert on that one? I can provide that. No, neither, neither, Councillor Wayne's correct. Neither of the sites on which you travel as are in camp uh, have planning permission as temporary sites. Um, that that it, Whilst that might be acceptable for a short period of time, there becomes a time after which it, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't continue, in my view. Can I just come back? If you're very quick, because I've got quite a lot waiting. Thank you. Uh, it, I think two years is too long, personally, but you may think different. Um, in relation, I, I, all I'd like to just say is that uh, Councillor Hobson makes a very valid point. We need to be getting this in the best position that whenever a new council is gathered together, they need to be able to act very quickly. And we've got to have all that information ready for as early possible, May, June, you know, we've got to be ready to go. So anything we can do now to move that along, that would be absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Councillor Statham. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, out here, out here I've just started look, looking forward into the future. Uh, uh, major planning applications, I'm thinking like uh, Ashbourne Airfield, Corder Quarry. Uh, we do like uh, 106 where we want uh, the, the affordable housing. Can't we stipulate that we'd like a traveller site running alongside the major application? It's just a just a question. That that's a negotiation that can take place. Yes, it. it you know, I, I don't think anybody here would pretend that that will be an easy conversation with a developer. But yes, it, it's it's um it's something that can happen in theory. You're quite correct, Councillor Stephen. Councillor Morley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's a comment, actually. Are, are we on questions or comments? We're still on questions. Uh, all right. I'll wait for to come back on okay. comments since I have been brought into the conversation. Okay. Councillor Bull. Yes, thank you, Chair. I was. My question is: the fact is, how much in the, for the constitution of what you wrote for this working group can that not continue to carry on and define what needs to be done? Um, without it having to come back, because obviously within that constitution, a working group was not to defined to anybody until they put some. So surely there is work that can be done behind the scenes without a definite decision having to be made so that it looks and that we are not sat back doing nothing, twiddling the thumbs till after the actually the elections have happened and going into the new thing. Surely something in there can continue that has already been doing in this in pre previously, we've been doing that already without it coming back to council. So why can that con not continue or can it? Thanks, Councillor Ball. I think in the, the answer I gave to Councillor Wayne, I confirmed that um, uh, the first part of the terms of reference of the working group, in my view, would allow it to effectively commission that, that viability assessment with a view to it making a recommendation one way or another back to council after the election. So it can go ahead, in my view. So, so within that, can that proposal and your recommendations on there be changed to that wording? And then we don't have to go any further because at the end of the day, we know that you're not going to sit back and twiddle your thumbs. Work is still going to be carried on. No dis full decisions are going to be made until the new council, but we are still working on this process. Through you, Chair, no, nothing's been proposed or seconded yet, so if members wish to do that, then it's, it's, it's an option that's available to them. Uh, Councillor O'Brien. Yeah, thank you for allowing me to come back with a, a second question, Chair, but I think some of the answers raise further questions for me. Now, um, we hear from uh, Tim Braun that 
confirms there are two two families who uh, are affected by our decision making process. Um, it, we're told that they are not prepared to accommodate themselves on the same site, and we've had, I think, confirmation that we will not oblige um, a family with specific vulnerabilities to go to a site uh, which they don't feel is appropriate for them. However, however, we are only considering one site in this exercise. Now that, am I right in saying that that implies that one of the, f the families that we currently have a homeless duty to will continue to occupy either Matlock Station or uh, Matlock Bath car park. Is that the implication of um, own, it, the working party says its its job is done, so it is not going to look at any more sites. So we only have one site. Am I, am I right in saying the implication of what is proposed is that for the foreseeable future, there will be one family to which we have a homeless duty continuing to occupy one or other of the two current sites. Chair, I think the implication is that at the moment there's one site that's being looked at. I don't believe that the working group has said that its work is concluded. However, by virtue of where we are in the electoral cycle, it may not have the same membership on the working group after the, the 4th of May. Um, the conversations, and members can speak for themselves actually when they get into debate, but my recollection of the discussion on Tuesday afternoon was that members wanted to get this to a point where something was progressing um, so that something could back, come back to the new council um, after the election and there would be and there was an anticipation that there would be further work done after the election. I think everybody recognises that the, the authority still has a need to, uh, still needs to meet its statutory duty and therefore, at least in terms of temporary site provision, um, there is still work for this group to do as there remains work for the local plan working party to do in respect to permanent site provision and the council. Uh, but am I, am I right in my assumption that with the current recommendation for one site, that implies that one of the two currently occupied sites will remain in occupation? I think that's the implication any reasonable person would take from that, yes. Councillor Burfoot. Yeah, thanks for that. Allowing me to come back, uh, Chair. Um, members want, need to be reminded that uh, in the current local plan, which was approved, I think, in 2017, um, there was a proposal, and it was a, well, it's an approved site uh, off Mayfield Road, south of Ashbourne, uh, for a county council-owned site to be. In fact, it had planning consent, had a budget. I think it was about ten thousand pounds. It's probably more like fifty thousand pounds now to convert it for uh, one of the two families. Uh, but then, when the present administration of the county council took over. Uh, they withdrew that uh, proposed lease agreement with this council and so that's why we're in the position we are now essentially but uh, uh, members will also be aware that um, I think the working party have looked at uh, the depot owned by this council and not a million miles from the one that had been approved in the local plan so can, can I ask what the uh, situation is with regards to that side because I've not heard that mentioned tonight I know it has been discussed by the uh, traveller working group so can I ask about that Um, this is a weird uh, question and answer session because I'm effectively answering a report on behalf of a working group I'm not a member of. But the, 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 I think the answer to, to that question was that it was considered, um, but there wasn't um, there wasn't a decision to progress investigating that site further. Um, I am aware it's been raised. It was raised in the council meeting uh, recently, um, and if members wish to to relook at that, then that's an option that's available either to the working group if it continues after the election or for another another um, decision-making body, whatever we have after the election. Councillor Hobson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think we're going off the point a bit now. We're talking about, and, and people on the group will, will agree with me, you know, we are where we are tonight. And, and I think you've, the other members from your comments, you, you've seen the, the, the point that we are. We've worked so hard. We would like to progress these to a point where 
council can make the decision. We're very keen that council members make the decision. But anything that we can do that you can suggest, which would be legally possible to continue the work so that there isn't just what eight ten weeks of, of doing nothing that work can continue and particularly with with the car parking but i want it to be open and transparent that we talk about it and other people can see the decision making process so thank you james you're in the hot seat again Sorry, was there a, was there a question there? Sorry, Councillor. No, no, it was uh, just a. Uh, well, can you can you can you frame a words for us for these two recommendations? The recommendations are to go to the next, to the full council, and I think there's the frustration that nothing is going to be happening. That's but, and to get out to the wider community, they can see that you know things do take time to to be done, but we have a, a proper statutory process we have to go through with decision making so i think in terms of the the questions that have been put to me tonight if that was um if that's the mood of the meeting that the work continues in terms of the the appraisal of the, the site that's been discussed then that in my view can be taken forward because it falls within the terms of reference of the the working group therefore you know the appraisal work could come back to the working group post-election um or even pre-election, there's nothing stopping the working group meeting before the 4th of May, if we were to get that information before then. Um, what that would mean is that the, there would be something to bring forward to council if that was the will of the working group. Um, and we'd have to have a conversation about whether that was the annual meeting um, or whether that was a, a another meeting soon after that date. But my view is that the work can continue. Um, it can continue as it has done in the run up to the election but there won't be a public discussion about it because of the, the pre-election period that we're now in. Councillor Hughes. Thank you, Chair. Um, on the same basis, and, and noting the requirement for two travellers' sites, um, is it possible to also take forward the depot that was referred to by Councillor Burfoot in the same sort of way, um, looking at the, the issues that would arise whether the whether the, the 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 depot will become available, whether it will uh, in part or in whole, and whether there uh, would therefore be space in the um, in the depot for for a traveller's site. Thank you, Councillor Hobson. You want to come back, uh, Councillor Hughes? I think we're going off track again. These are very simple, straightforward recommendations that have come from the working group. They're the recommendations. You know. Things might come in the future, but we've just got these two recommendations tonight to work on. We cannot really be going off at a tangent about other things. That may that may be for later conversation. Chair, through you, the uh, this this site has come up before, and we've had an a, an informal assessment of the site, um, and I don't know what on what basis that it was excluded from the recommendation. Um, my, my belief is that it should be in included um, because it looks like a prima facie case that one that could be taken forward. It's in the ownership of the council. Uh, it's, it's, we'll have facilities and all sorts of things. So uh, with, with your permission, I would like to ask you again whether it could be included in the, in the recommendation. Chair, if I deal with it purely from a procedural point of view, the answer to that question is yes, it you could make a recommendation here tonight for the working group to include that and undertake a viability assessment. Um, it'll be up to the working group to determine whether it wishes to bring that back to council so it doesn't commit the working group to anything but in terms of procedurally asking the question or putting the question procedurally that's a sound uh, proposal. May I come back again then? I'd like to move then that uh, the uh, we, adopt, we take recommendations one uh, A and B and uh, and um, but we also include the proposal to um, yeah all of the conclusions in 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, B and uh, and and for and and 4.4, um, and but we also include a vibe a further assessment of the council depot uh, in Ashbourne. Uh, that could be potentially that has been assessed previously in an informal way um, to determine whether it it also uh, would make a 
a traveller's site and the implications for the council. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was the one to Councillor Hobson. Councillor Did you want to speak, Councillor Hobson, because you did have your hand up? Well, I, I just think we're, we're, we've got two quite simple recommendations that the, that the Gypsy and Traveller Working Group have worked on. Uh, we've gone through us. You might as well say, any site let's bring any site back to be you know we've, we've we've gone through this can we just do this and then look who will there'll be different people on the working group next year you know we we took a lot of time i think it'll take you back to the move to a, a, a previous temporary site that was that was brought through without a great deal of discussion and uh, this behind the scenes work is so useful i'm sure mike will agree I'd just prefer the two just to go through. Councillor Wayne. Yeah, I thought the, the reason for us having a committee is to discuss what is best for the the um, travellers with the you know homeless homeless need, but also to to put our the, the the subsequent council, the new council coming in, the best possible position to move things forward. Now, to me. Do we really want one of the travellers groups to be still on a car park in Matlock Bath or Matlock come next September and one may be down at the Woodyard? Or are we going to not just be simple about things but look a little bit further into the future and think, yes, let's assess the viability of um, our property in Ashbourne in a location that has, has got main services Check the viability. If the viability comes back that it's no good, then it's done. But if it comes back that it is viable, then we are doing what's right by these people that have got the homelessness need. And I don't think we should be going for simple. I appreciate what the Gypsy Group, the, the Traveller Group have gone and uh, done. But at the end of the day, we want the best thing out of tonight and so we can move forward next year. Thank you. Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd like to speak in support of the uh, amendment. I think it's uh, entirely appropriate. I think it's the Council showing it is open and transparent. Uh, if I recall the uh, appraisal that was made of the particular site that's referred to in Ashbourne, it was shown to meet all the criteria which are, are set down. Um, I would be very uneasy if we reach a half solution as others have said, that we accommodate one homeless family but take a decision which directly implies that we're not meeting the needs of a second homeless family. I think that is, that is not a responsible attitude by the Council. I think the proposal put forward uh, will put the new Council in the best possible position to find a sustainable way forward for both families for which we have a homelessness responsibility. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Ratcliffe. I just wanted to comment, uh, Chair, if you'd allow me, that um, the amendment, uh, uh, as uh, suggested, has uh, some of my sympathy uh, and it's a position that uh, I have either openly or indirectly um, suggested before within the working group. But, but but we, ha but there has been that initial assessment, uh, and um, it, it was accepted. Uh, and at the end of the day, any individual like myself works within a, a, a within a, a framework of democracy, uh, and that's been the great thing about this uh, group that y you feel that you know. Um, your views are listened to, but at the end of the day, we work on majority decisions. Um, and the decision last time was that the information coming back showed that this was a non-viable uh, site. However, I think things have somewhat changed. And I 
I am now of the persuasion that there would be no good reason not to reevaluate re it. Uh, however, uh, I have also made the point uh, in connection with these recommendations that twice now um, sites, permanent sites, uh, I might add, have blown up in our faces for one reason or another. And that I felt why we wanted to move forward, keep going forward, we had to take on board a certain amount of caution over this and get things properly evaluated, properly assessed, and agreed by um, full council. Uh, and, and I think that's the underlying um, um, position, as it were. Uh, but um, I, I, I will close with this comment because I'm not going to be at the next council or indeed on this work, working group. But this working group is one of the best working groups I have had the pleasure of participating it in. It's been tasked with one of the most difficult uh, almost intractable problems that this council has ever faced. I have been involved in this, and, and I made a, uh, I'm sorry, I flippant across, to, to say that we've been looking at this certainly for the 20 years that I've been on this council, and my wife was involved in it for years before that, and we've never come up with an answer for many, many, a myriad uh, 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 of, of reasons. But I do feel that there's a little bit of chink, there's a little chink of light now starting to appear, but we must do it properly. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and with a certain caution, because yeah. otherwise we'll end up with mistakes again yeah, as occurred yeah, yeah. before and, and everybody knows what i'm talking about those two occasions when we had to withdraw thank you right so we have an amendment on the table are we going to go to the vote on that one so you have a proposal on the table it's not an amendment right because councillor hughes proposed the recommendations of the working group with additional recommendations right. so that's what's on the table so we'll go to the vote on so unless there is anyone else, Councillor Hughes wants to come back. May I just come back for, uh, with a, a comment on um, on democracy? Um, when I was 13, I was in school in America, and my very good history teacher there said that democracy wasn't just majority; it was a major. It was ruled by the majority, taking into consideration the interests of the minorities. And uh, I, I've lived with that all my life. I think it's a very good definition of, of majority. I think it's a great history teacher. Uh, but in this case, um, I think uh, I agree with I agree that we need to tread carefully and cautiously and do full viability assessments. I think what the we've done in the past is not to produce to do those full assessments. The criteria that we've used have not been thorough. And uh, maybe the working party has 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 adopted um, more thorough criteria than than previously. Yet there is a site which looks looks as if it meets a large number of the requirements. It's close to reasonably close to a, a an urban centre. Uh, yet it is not um, close to housing. It's um, it it meets the needs of the of a particular family that needs that wants. To, that who, whose family relationships are to the south of the, co the county. And um, to, to be honest, I was surprised that it wasn't carried forward by the working group um, to a, to, to a, into a recommendation, um, particularly when um, the, other, the, the other one has been to planning before and has failed at, at the planning stage for various reasons. So. I, I, I am surprised at the attitude that has, be, that has been taken to a relatively straightforward additional measure so that we're not producing a half a solution, as Councillor um, O'Brien said. We'd, we'd be producing possibly a full solution to the issue. And I, I think officers will understand that I'm not being parochial here because I have made proposals about how we, a, a, a site could be provided in Matlock that was um, feasible, but 
uh, that hasn't been taken forward by uh, council or by the working group. And uh, therefore, I, I, I don't believe I'm being parochial in this matter. Uh, but I do believe that we should be taking forward two sites um, and that it seems reason it seems sensible to do an, an assessment during the during the period when we can't have meetings in order for for the council to be fully prepared uh, when it comes back into session and it's not concerned with uh, the this is different from the way in which we adopted the previous two proposals where uh, all we're doing here is not making a decision about the site, all we're doing is making a decision to assess the site. Previously, we were making decisions about the site, and that is the difference. So, so uh, and I rest my position there. Thank you, sir. Councillor Wayne, if it'll be quick, be very brief. Uh, I'll try. Um, I just, I'm with Councillor Hughes on this. It, we want to move forward, and we want to get, if we can get two, the two groups housed that would be fantastic but the minimum we do is must we must uh, assess the viability of both and as such could i call for a recorded vote please thank you councillor ratcliffe i just very quickly chair wanted to say that i do agree with the amendment i'm going to support it <laughs> however you've got you know sometimes fact gets distorted or it's subject to perception First of all, the point about the Woodyard planning application was that the planning application was more for permanent site siting there. Uh, that was the overriding reason why it was first refused all those years ago. But temporary provision, as indicated in uh, the, the recommendations here uh, is it actually was actually uh, 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 permitted. I, I think Tim would, you know, uh, elaborate on, on that. But the essence of what I've just said is, is correct. Uh, uh, but secondly, that first assessment of the depot at Ashbourne was subject to quite rigorous. Um, um, evidence by uh, the um, clean and green uh, department uh, uh, there that was sent back to the work group who uh, assessed it, looked at it, and felt that on the basis of what we were being told at that time, there was no room to move forward. But I've made the point that we've we've got we're under a, a review now of clean and green, and 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 I feel that circumstances are changing when another assessment could easily be done for the use of this in perhaps a, a few months or six months time. I, 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 I don't know when, uh, but uh, I don't think the the cap on, on um, um, uh, not accepting it, it exists uh, 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 as such now. I just, so I just wanted to, you know, just make those points. But I agree with you. I'm not <laughs> arguing. Okay. Councillor Ball. Yes, thank you, Chair, for letting me come back in. Um, there's a couple of issues that I think I can understand um, that everybody wants to keep this going. But I felt that the continuation of what work had already been done within the working group should be the thing that was continued, not going into something new, because we're in the similar situation that what right have half of the members around here got to be saying something if we don't determine to come back as councillors. I just feel that there's something that needs to be continued in work of what's happened so far, what you've got on the table. Um, and I do believe, and Councillor um, Ratcliffe has just, what's the name, the prior, the, the constitution of whatever it's called as regards what the working party was supposed to do, the working group, it was to look for temporary sites. Uh, and then I believe that's what's come through at this moment in time. Um, 
So, you know, I feel that adding these others in is an extra. And I think that my idea was to continue the work that's already been done uh, and move that forward and carry on progressing with what needs to be done with, with what's been put in the recommendations uh, to bring back. There's nothing, and then obviously in the full council, you, you, they start again. It's them to make that decision of where they go from there on it. Chair, I, I, I'm going to make a procedural point before you move to the vote, just so that everybody's absolutely clear on what they're voting on. So, Councillor Hughes has proposed um, the working group's recommendations as well as inserting an additional recommendation in respect of uh, a viability assessment for the Ashbourne Depot owned by the District Council. So, that will be that's the motion that's in front of you. Um, if you vote that down, um, then the working group's recommendations aren't accepted. So to help out procedurally, and it will look nonsensical to anybody watching this, but effectively there would have to be an amendment to remove Councillor Hughes's um, inserted recommendation because that's yeah. the only proposal on the table. So if, you know, and I'm reading the mood of the room in giving this advice, but I want to avoid embarrassing um, scenes in terms of how votes play out. So if, if the feeling was that members weren't supportive of that, then you would have to put forward an amendment to delete Councillor Hughes's insertion of the viability assessment for the Ashbourne Depot. If that was successful, that would then become the substantive motion that the committee would then be invited to, to vote on. I'm sure that's clear as mud to most people yeah. in the room and watching, but procedurally that's the correct thing to yeah. do yeah. if you don't. So what I want to make absolutely clear is if you vote against the motion as it stands, you're rejecting the recommendations of the working group. So just against the... <laughs> then I recommend that we take off what Councillor Hughes has said, because I think we're just going against all the work that, uh, that, that the working group has done. If, if that means that what you're, you're taking everything off the table, then I, I propose that that is taken down, because it's just taken away the amount of work and the fact that everybody's gone collectively, as Mr. Councillor Ratcliffe has said, that he felt that he was getting on. That's a good thing. Um, but it, obviously now it, it isn't. Um, and I, I think it's just going against everything. And maybe others that are not on the committee are being able to try and put a voice at a committee meeting, which isn't the whole council, to try and make a decision that what working group have done is no good. So my, counter, my, my proposal is to take that amendment off. Councillor Morley. I, I will second that as well, because I'm with Councillor Ratcliffe. That I think the working group have done a super job, and I think Messive now with their recommendations is unnecessary and a slightly veiled criticism of the work that we've done, which I have to say I'm not happy about. So, Chair, you're now in a, a, you've got a proposal for an amendment on the table to delete what Councillor Hughes inserted into the substantive motion. Um, so you're in a separate debate now where everybody else who's spoken before can speak on the amendment. Councillor Hughes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I seem to remember a, a period in the, in the past when um, Mr Braun brought forward a number of recommendations about temporary tolerated sites and the members opposite, uh, led by Councillor Morley, voted them all down without any discussion and left us with in the sorry state we're in at the moment when that to Mr. Braun's recommendations would have been very sensible indeed because they would have spread the, the given opportunities for traveler sites, uh, temporary traveler sites uh, across the count, uh, across the district. And uh, so I, I, and I think we're here again. So we've got, what we, all the, we're doing is asking for, a, for an assessment we're not asking for a decision to be made. We're not asking for anything to be taken off the table. We're, as we're asking for an assessment of an additional site, and that's all. And to to to, to uh, then again remove a site, which uh, and I think Councillor Morley actually seconded the removal yet again. I know he's a fa he 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 um it gets on very well with travellers. He's got a traveller site in his in one of in his ward. And he's very proud of that. I know that. So this isn't. I'm sure this isn't something personal. Um, but uh, I, I would. I, but I would appreciate that he would vote with, with, um, 
uh, against the amendment that he's actually, because of his, uh, his attitude towards travellers and, and support of them, uh, as evidenced in the past. Thank you very much. Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm, I would hate this debate to become confrontational between two sides of the chamber. I think we've avoided that to date. It would be very disappointing if we degenerated uh, along that uh, lines now. Uh, I'm disappointed that the amendment's been, been put forward uh, for what I think are procedural reasons. We, we have an opportunity with the uh, original proposal to find a solution to a problem which, as others have said, we've had for a number of years. And I think it's an, an obligation on us all to seize the opportunity to find that solution, as uh, Councillor Wayne has said, rather than half a solution. So it, is, it will be quite open to the new Council to uh, take a view on the two appraisals when they're brought forward. Uh, we are not taking, as others have said, as Councillor Burford has said, we're not taking a decision, um, oh, sorry, which was Councillor Burford or Councillor Hughes, I'm not, we're not taking a decision on the principle of the location. We're, we're giving ourselves as members the opportunity to have as much information as possible in order for us to take an informed decision, and a decision which will enable us to uh, reach a solution to the in, seemingly intractable problem of two housing two homeless families. And I, as I said, I, I go back to saying, it, it would, I think it would be totally irresponsible of us, all of us, not to take that opportunity. Councillor Hobson. Everything that Councillor Ratcliffe has said about the working group, the people that are on the working group, the hours that we have spent, we've had officers speaking to us, we've had a report from the Clean and Green, we've listened to ward members, and for you, to, frankly, just to come and say, oh, let's look at this again, you know, when, you know, this has been, it has been looked at, and then it comes to the council to decide what, what, what happens. We've got two quite straightforward things on the table. We've got to be sure what we're voting for two quite straightforward things on the table to move gently forward that full council can make a decision. Let's keep it simple, please. Councillor Morley. No, I was just going to comment there that we're, we're certainly not going to be confrontational. We're just quite good at debate. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Burford. I'm going to say that some contrary to what's just been said i mean we've got we're voting on a and b supposedly but then an additional c which is that further work be undertaken to provide a full appraisal of, of a public uh, a council-owned site to assess its viability of potential delivery of a, either a temporary or a permanent site and I, I cannot see why we shouldn't consider um, a site within the geographical area that one of the fam traveler families has this aspiration to reside in at, at the moment we've got one just south of the central area one um, uh, in the central area and you know we've got nothing in the south where this family want to reside so it, it just makes sense to me to include a site in, in another geographical area. Councillor Wayne did you want to speak because I'm wanting to draw it to a close now. Yes sir I am thank you. Um, I, I'm really surprised at, at the reluctance of, of the leading group to want to not put the best case scenario to the next council. I mean, there's so much more. There's this clean and green um, assessment that's been um, done. Um, there's a chance that there's going to be re reduced numbers at that location. The actual site was looked at initially, as far as I'm aware, as a dual site. And uh, it's quite, you know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that it can be a, a sole site. And all we're asking, all we're asking is that this, the site is assessed, the viability of the site is assessed now, not ages ago, now. And I, I, I'm amazed at the, you know, views of the leading group now. Thank you. 
Anyone else wishing to speak? Councillor Fitzherbert. Can I just add, I think we're voting on the the original motion, I think. Is that right? On, you, on MP or on Councillor Hughes's? You, you're voting on the amendment that Councillor Ball put forward, which is to delete the insertion right, okay. of the provisions okay. that Councillor I'd, Hughes inserted. With the I'd just like to say, I'd, I'd really like to thank our officers for, 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 for bearing with us um, tonight and for all the hard work they've done in, in this, in, in over all the years that I've been on council and probably many more now. Uh, but we we had a working group to, to make recommendations, and I think it was a cross party group. It sounds like it, it went really well, and that's what I'll be voting for tonight. So, Chair, just to be absolutely clear, you're voting on an amendment now, and the amendment is to delete the insertion of the viability assessment of the Ashbourne Depot. If that was approved, then effectively the substantive proposal is the recommendation set out in the report. Is everybody clear on what they're voting could, for? Could we have a recorded vote on this, Chair, please? Could we have a recorded vote? So, you're voting on the amendment that Councillor Ball put forward, which was to delete the reference that Councillor Hughes made to the viability assessment for Ashbourne Depot. Do we then vote on the... You will then return to the debate on the substantive proposal, and if there aren't any speakers, then you'd vote on whatever the substantive proposal is at that point in time. I've just heard Councillor O'Brien request a recorded vote. There needs to be another member for us to give... There we go. So it will be a recorded vote. So Tommy will conduct the recorded vote, Chair. So, this is the vote on the amendment. Um, so, we've got Councillor Buckler. Against. Councillor Ball. Ball. Councillor Burfoot. Against. Councillor Buttle. Against. Councillor Fitzherbert. Four. Councillor Froggart. Four. Councillor Finesse. Four. Four. Councillor Hobson. Four. Councillor Hughes. Against. Councillor Morley. Councillor Murphy. Councillor O'Brien. Against. Councillor Ratcliffe. Against. Councillor Rose. Four. Councillor Statham. And Councillor Wayne. Against. So the amendment is successful. So the... Sorry. So the amendment is now the substantive motion, which is the effect of the amendment was to delete reference to the Ashbourne depot being uh, assessed for could its viability. We, could we have the results of the vote, please, Chair? It was nine. Apologies, Chair. It's been a long few weeks. You have the casting vote on this matter, Chair. Okay. If you choose not to, then the proposal falls. If you vote for it, the proposal is carried. If you vote against it... <laughs> I, voted, I voted for it in the first place, so... Four. So you're voting for the amendment? Uh, yes. For... So the numbers then on, on the, the the numbers were equal after the original vote. The chairman has used their um, casting vote, so therefore the amendment has been successful. Therefore, for the ease of anybody watching and in the room, and for my own sanity, I think at the minute that the proposal that's on the table now is what's written down in the working group's report. So that is the recommendation or the motion before you presently. <clears throat> so, Chair, just to, you're back in the debate on the substantive motion. It, ha it has been moved and seconded, yeah. thank you, uh, Councillor Finesse, because it was proposed by Councillor Hughes, seconded by Councillor Burfoot, along with what's just been taken out. So, you're back in the original debate on what is written in the report, and Councillor Buttle's got his hand up yeah. to speak on that debate, Chair. Councillor Buttle. 
thank you very much, Chair. Um, this is why the Independent and Green Group dropped out of the Gypsy and Traveller Sites uh, Working Group because it is actually controlled politically and it's not a cross-party. We've just seen exactly what the problem is. This is the Conservatives taking control and behaving in a political manner. Thank you. Councillor Hobson. I think we've heard Councillor Ratcliffe talk about how well um, the Gypsy and Traveller Working Group has worked together. And I'm sure uh, our other member here would agree. But, well, thank you, Chair. Uh, can I, yeah, can I say the responsibility of the cleaning, uh, the uh, the Green Group of dropping out is, I would have said, sad, but their decision. So if they didn't want to get involved in the discussion and the work, then that's not really a political issue. It's an issue of getting the sleeves rolled up and getting on with the job. Anybody else wishing to speak? There was a request for this vote to be recorded as well, Chair, but it wasn't. There wasn't a second word that I anticipate someone will say they want it to be a recorded vote. Councillor O'Brien, thank you. So, okay. Tommy will undertake the vote, Chair. Yeah, go to the vote. So you're voting on yeah. the recommendations in the report. Yeah, they're written down. Yeah. Music the so, for the vote on the on the substantive motion, Councillor Buckler, for Councillor Burfoot, Councillor Ball, Councillor Buttle, for Councillor Fitzherbert, Councillor Froggart, for Councillor Finesse, for Councillor Hobson. I'm just making sure it's substantive before. <laughs> Councillor Hughes. Four. Councillor Morley. Four. Councillor Murphy. Four. Councillor O'Brien. Abstain. Councillor Ratcliffe. Four. Councillor Rose. Four. Councillor Statham. Four. And Councillor Wayne. That's carried. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That ends tonight's meeting. Mm -hmm.